Okay, welcome to our sixth and final session here on Biblical Chronology, and we are looking at the New Testament. Uh, I'm just going to preface this by saying there's a ton more stuff here than we have time to look at. So once again, I'm going to give you a general overview with a little more detail on a couple of things. Um, again, a lot of this is not controversial, or at least not significantly controversial as far as timing and stuff goes. Uh, I find this fascinating, and so I've thrown this in as well. Julian calendar was introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. That year was 708 AUC, which was from the foundation of the city, by which, of course, Julius Caesar meant Rome. His calendar was 365 days in length with a leap year every fourth year. Just like ours, right? Almost. <laughs> you don't understand the intricacies of our leap year system yet. <laughs> In AD 525, Pope John I commissioned the monk Dionysus uh, to construct a Christian calendar. And he determined that Christ was born December 25th, 754 AUC. So, 754 AUC became AD 1 in his system. He's the one that began to run the calendar according to the date of the birth of Christ. So that was in... AD 525. In the days of Pope Gregory the uh, 13th, about 1580, the Julian calendar was reformed and it corrected for two errors. The solar year is actually 365.2425 days long rather than 365.25. So the calendar had been gaining about 11 minutes a year, the Julian calendar, or about three days in 400 years. So in the new calendar, every year that's exactly divisible by four is a leap year, just like it had been earlier, except for years that are exactly divisible by 100. The centurial years that are exactly divisible by 400 are still leap years. For example, the year 1900 is not a leap year, but the year 2000 is a leap year. You didn't know our system was that complex, did you? <laughs> but it works. I wasn't around in 1900 to notice that they didn't mark it as a leap year. <coughs> in the Julian calendar, it would have been. But... In the new Gregorian calendar, it's not. It was not. The Gregorian calendar also corrected for this loss by skipping 10 days at that time in order to restore March 21 as the date of the vernal equinox, first day of spring. So, a little information on our calendar. Eventually, it was determined that Dionysius had miscalculated in his dates. Herod the Great died in 4 B.C., and thus, Jesus was also born earlier, not in 1 B.C. or 1 A.D. And by the way, there is no zero, no year zero. So we skip from 1 B.C. to 1 to A.D. 1 uh, with no intervening zero. That can be confusing if you're counting across that, that stretch. <coughs> um, when did Herod the Great die? Josephus records an eclipse of the moon shortly before Herod's death. Uh, I won't read you that quote. You can take my word for that there. It can be calculated that this eclipse happened on March 12th, 13th, that, that night uh, in 4 BC. And Herod died before the Passover that year which is the first day, um, the first day which was April 11, 
since the 34th year of his reign didn't begin until Nisan the 1st, which is March 29th, his death would have occurred between March 29 and April 11, 4 BC. We don't know an exact date, but it's somewhere in that, in that two-week window or less than two-week. <clears throat> if that's correct, then Jesus could not have been born later than the spring of 4 BC. Uh, so here I have a timeline for you, and I have expanded out that, that period between uh, 5 and 4 B.C. Uh, you can see Herod's reign down there at the bottom, uh, his year 33, and then he just got into his 34th year uh, before passing away. So we had a lunar eclipse in March. We had the death of Herod at the end of March, beginning of April, and then the Passover at the uh, second week of April. This uh, timeline up at the top goes with the, the broader timeline that you see up there too, which shows the death of Herod and then the way that his kingdom was split among his sons. <coughs> Uh, the the section uh, up at the top that I've added in now, those are various governors of Syria. Um, there's quite a bit of discussion about the census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Uh, we know of a Quirinius who governed from A.D. 6 and on. Uh, there's quite a bit of discussion, and I think some some decent satisfactory answers uh, as to the, the text there in Luke, but I'm not going to go into that with you guys now. Uh, suffice it to say, we have probably in uh, November, December of 5 BC, uh, the holy couple traveling down to Bethlehem. We have the birth of Christ, um, I think probably in December the very end of 5 B.C., the visit of the Magi, and then uh, the family takes off for Egypt, and Herod the Great uh, orders the destruction of all the toddlers in Bethlehem. Now, this is just like two months before he passes away, before his death. Before I move on to the year of Jesus' crucifixion, I might just say a little something more about the timing of, um, just because I find it interesting, <coughs> the birth, the visit of the Magi, and the toddlers being killed in Bethlehem. Have you ever heard folks suggest that Jesus was about two years old when the Magi visited? Do you know why they suggest that? Because obviously that's not what I've put on the chart here, right? It's because of the statement that Herod wanted all of the toddlers two and under killed. Oh, well then he must have thought Jesus was two years old. Right? So the Magi didn't come for like a couple of years. What's the real reason that Herod said, kill them all two years and younger? Not because Jesus was two years old or that he thought Jesus was two years old. Who did he send down to execute this command? Soldiers, right? Rough and tumble guys. Are soldiers good at estimating the age of babies? No, none of them had birth certificates. So you couldn't go to the birth certificate office and make a list of who's how old and who to kill. So he's sending down a, a cohort of guys to kill infants. He wants to be sure that he gets the one, right? So what does he tell them? Just kill the ones that are up to nine months old. 
the ones that are up to 10 months old. How do we know if they're 10 or 11 months? So he, he, he pads the number, he hedges his bet, and says, if they're two or younger, you can tell. I mean, two-year-olds are typically walking. So if they're not walking, kill them. Not because he thought Jesus was two years old, but because he wanted to be sure that he killed the Messiah. Okay. The year of Jesus' crucifixion. There's some interesting... Um, deductions we can make here and some interesting data in the text. Luke 3 tells us that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, at which time Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was the tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was the tetrarch of Abilene. That's a lot of information during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. This is the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry. And it began in the 15th year of Tiberius. We can calculate that fairly easily. Uh, it would be somewhere in the latter half of the year AD 28, possibly as late as the beginning of what we would call AD 29. And all of these other people, we know uh, when Pontius Pilate was governor <coughs> from 26 to 36. Um, Herod Ant uh, Antipas, Herod Philip, and Joseph, the son of Caiaphas, was high priest. So that year, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, uh, Tiberius' 15th year <coughs> coincides with all of the others uh, that are listed in these two passages. And so that's the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry. So, Jesus had to be crucified between 29 <coughs> and not later than the year 36. Would you grant me that? <laughs> Can't be earlier than the ministry of John the Baptist. And uh, not later than the year 36. The Jewish month was 29 or 30 days uh, in length. It was based on the phases of the moon. Uh, so the first of the month occurred on a different day of the week each year. Uh, that's not dissimilar from our own month. Um, the Passover lamb was chosen on the 10th day of the first month, and the lamb was to be sacrificed on the 14th. Jesus, of course, was crucified at the beginning of Passover. Uh, so Colin Humphreys, uh, who's a biblicist and a mathematician, um, and there are others as well, but I'm taking this specifically from Humphreys, uh, calculate that a Friday as the beginning of Passover would fit with the years A.D. 30 and with the year A.D. 33. And you can see there what Passover began with on the other years. Just as an example at the top, uh, A.D. 26, Passover would have begun on a Sunday. That doesn't work very well with the gospel narrative, so we can cancel out Sunday as a possibility at A.D. 26. <clears throat> so we're left uh, with deduction there but between uh, A.D. 30 and A.D. 33. So two possibilities. Uh, in John... 2 and verse 20, the Jews said to Jesus, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? So we know that Herod was elected as the king of the Jews by the Roman Senate in 40 B.C. Uh, he came back to the Holy Land, killed Antigonus, the last of the Maccabean kings, and took the throne in 36, and he died uh, in early in 4 B.C. So um, in the 18th year of his reign, which was in the year 19, he began to construct the temple. Uh, Josephus tells that to us uh, there in Antiquities of the Jews. <clears throat> in the 18th year of his reign, 
After the Acts already mentioned, he undertook a great variety of work uh, to build by himself the temple of God. And I'll let you read the rest of that at your leisure. He completed the temple itself within about a year, year and a half, but that did not conclude construction. Uh, he still had much to build there, but the temple itself only in that period. What the Jews are referring to uh, is, is the larger construction. Um, when they say it's taken 46 years to build this temple, they're talking about all of the other ancillary stuff, the, the grand stoa at the end, the temple mount that he extended off to the south, uh, the, perhaps even the fortress of Antonia, a uh, whole variety there within that complex. So if we take the 46 or 47 years from the end of the temple construction and up until uh, when he began, uh, to when they're, they're making this statement, that puts us right about the year 29, AD 29, uh, that they were making the statement. And that fits with what we looked at earlier. So uh, it seems appropriate to put the beginning of Jesus' ministry there in the year 29, uh, both based on when John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius and on the statement of the Jews <coughs> uh, regarding the length of the construction of the temple by Herod the Great. Okay. Luke 3 tells us that when Jesus began his ministry, he was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. If Jesus was born in December 5th, uh, in December of 5 BC, he would have been about 33 or 34 in the year AD 29. Is that close enough for being about 30? Okay, I'm good with it. <laughs> it does say about, it's not exact. The Gospels imply that Jesus' ministry was about three years in length. Uh, roughly that. We have a couple of references to Passover and various things he would go up. Um, none of the Gospels give a strict timeline uh, for Jesus' life, but it appears to be about three years in length. Uh, that would place his crucifixion in the spring of A.D. 33. So... That would give us the start of John's ministry in about 28, Jesus sometime in 29, and then the crucifixion in A.D. 33. There's your New Testament uh, handout. Uh, it has some very small type on it. It's got a lot of information. By the way, this is adapted from a chart originally put out by James Boyer. Uh, that I found really helpful. Um, I have changed some things and added some things, but uh, that's, that's the, the base from which it comes. If I could take just a moment to explain this and then we'll be done. Uh, the, the top set of lines is a broad view of the New Testament period. You can see the Roman rulers. Uh, down below the timeline, you can see Jesus' birth, His ministry, uh, the apostolic ministry, particularly of Paul, that gets expanded at the bottom half of this chart. Uh, so that's where it goes. Uh, you'll see the first and second Jewish revolts there. And then I've listed for you a bunch of papyri. These are New Testament manuscripts. Uh, they're the earliest ones that we have. And you can see on that chart that they're not terribly far removed from the autographs. Uh, which I find uh, quite fascinating. Um, below that portion of the chart, we have Jesus' public ministry. Uh, so it's a, it's a rough sketch of when and where Jesus would have been uh, during the various gospel periods. I've got uh, sections out of Matthew there. Uh, that seems to be one of the, the more chronologically oriented 
And then the most complicated section uh, in the lower half is the apostolic ministry of Paul. Uh, it's based around the book of Acts, which runs kind of right through the center there. Uh, it's got his first, second, and third missionary journeys, a couple of imprisonments, one in Caesarea and one in Rome. Uh, we think he had some final travels after his first Roman imprisonment, uh, perhaps even a couple of the epistles written during that time. Um, you can see estimates there on the writings of his various epistles. Uh, further down, you can see the estimates for the writing of the Gospels. We don't have exact dates for the Gospels. Um, so those are, those are just estimates. Uh, further down in blue, those are the <laughs> reigns, if you will, of various high priests as they overlap. And you'll see that they end with the first Jewish revolt. There, there were no high priests in Jerusalem after that. Below the high priests, we have uh, rulers and governors of Judea. Um, King Herod Agrippa I uh, gradually was granted more and more area over which he ruled. That's the darker brown section in the middle. Um, and finally at the bottom are the, uh, the reigns of various Roman emperors. So you can, you can use that chart to figure out, uh, for example, when Paul writes to Timothy, at the end of his uh, end of his uh, end of Paul's ministry, you can see that that's during the the reign of Nero. So when Paul makes reference to Rome or the king or that kind of thing, uh, Nero was the king at that time. Uh, you can. You can access these things online if you want. Um, print them off, and hopefully those are those are helpful to you. And with that, I think we're done. Thanks for attending.